The March 2010 format, also known as Edison format, is one of the most renowned formats in the game. Although this format would not stick around for long with the release of the Shining Darkness on the horizon, Edison featured a diversity of strong decks, variations, and interactive duels. Edison format got its name from one SJC held during this short format, which took place in Edison, New Jersey. In today's video, we'll take a stroll down memory lane, visiting some of the format's strongest decks and information you'll need to get into the format. My name is Avery, and this is an Edison format retrospective. Edison format took place between the March 2010 banlist and the release of The Shining Darkness. Even though the format only lasted two and a half months, an abundance of new strategies appeared. Although Jeff Jones piloted Quick Draw Dandy Warrior to the SJC Edison Championship, it's still unclear whether it was the best deck of the format. Edison featured a variety of decks in the top 16, and with only one major event to test everything, the format was too short for a quote, winner of the format. With that being said, one of the reasons Edison is so renowned is due to the variety of quote, top decks, with many options such as Machine Gadgets, Black Wings, Light Swords, and even Gravekeeper Burn to play, Edison had one of the most diverse top 16s in Shonen Jump Championship history. Here is the ban list that went into effect for this format circa March 2010. Feel free to pause the video if you need to because there are a boatload of changes here. The TLDR of these changes is that these cards were abused in the September 2009 format and needed to be reeled in. Edison format hosted a wide range of skills at its highest level of play. These are some basic tips for gameplay to help you get better at the format. Keep in mind, however, that although these tips will mainly be using the top lists as reference material, Edison was short and still has many unexplored strategies, so feel free to try to make combos and decks for yourself. Because when I say you can play just about anything, I'm not kidding. The format is truly that diverse. Unlike the modern game, Edison didn't really have any starting combos that allowed you to run through your entire deck or splash your hand onto the field, or as we say on the channel, dropping a dookie on the opponent's board. But, although building a board was possible, it wasn't like the multiple negates you see in games today. I'm looking at Sword Soul, I'm also looking at Tri Brigade, I'm also looking at the future branded archetype that's going to come out, and uh, ah, that's, that's going to be a fun time. Back to, uh, back to Edison format, a much different time. Most games involved careful resource management and trying to make as many favorable trades as possible. Card advantage in theory was a simple concept. Any action that results in a net positive of cards was gaining card advantage. Simple cards such as Pot of Greed, even though the community says it's very complicated and I couldn't agree more, is also a very simple card that resulted in just a net plus one. In Edison, however, card advantage wouldn't come so freely. Cards like Pot of Avarice need you to have prior setup before it would become playable. Gadgets often would commit your normal summon to play a low attack monster. Even something as simple as Flamebell Fire Dog required you to play a brick in your deck. Card advantage also could come in ways you wouldn't expect. And when we talk about flame bells, keep a fired up Jonathan Barber in mind. Shout out to you, Barber. An example of this would be the use of Gravekeeper's Spy. Although Spy required a one-turn setup, it'll often net you an extra monster. To more experienced players, they chose to summon Gravekeeper's Descendant. Now, Descendant would then be used to trade Spy as a one-for-one -one, and then followed up with a potential Synchro or Tribute Summon. A follow-up play, such as going into Arcanite Magician, could quickly turn your two-card combo into a plus three or plus four, depending on the board state. Although most cards played in Edison were played to trade one-for-ones, well-timed responses could let cards potentially trade two for one or better. Cards such as Doom Caliber Knight that normally trade one for one could sometimes be optimized even further by beating over a monster. Utilizing every card to its fullest potential is essential in any format of the game, and Edison was no different. 
Edison format contained a lot of subtle interactions between cards that determined the pace of games. Although it could be said in any format, knowing the interactions between all your cards could create massive advantages in a match. Quick Draw Dandy Warrior is a great example of how subtle interactions between cards could lead to a terror in the format. The whole deck was built upon small combos that would create small but accumulating advantages. Interactions such as Debris Dragon and Quick Draw Synchron plus Dandelion would create a stronger monster with two tokens. These tokens would be used to either synchro again or could be tributed for powerful monsters such as Caius or Light and Darkness Dragon. Light and Darkness Dragon be one of my personal favorites in the entire game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Love that card. In some instances, though, these tokens could even act as fodder for Titanial. Although Quick Draw Dandy Warrior was probably the deck with the most of these interactions, other decks had small combos of their own. Black Wings, for example, had Shura into Vayu for a cheap Icarus attack. Some decks also played Cyber Valley to net draws off the tokens from Dandelion. Mastering subtle interactions lead to efficient play that will also lead to more wins. It's because of this that the best quick draw Dandelion players saw success while the many people who just net decked blindly did not. During Edison format, most of the non-engine archetype cards played in decks were more or less the same. Most decks played Book of Moon, Bottomless Trap Hole, Starlight Road, and your staple defensive trap cards. Most of the variance was found in the number of specific cards and or text you'd want to play. Specific cards such as Royal Oppression were only played in decks that could positively utilize it. Other cards such as Trap Dust Shoot were played due to preference. Because the traps played in the format were almost preset, reading and playing around cards is very important. Playing Heavy Storm into four back row could potentially win the game or run straight into a Starlight Road. In these situations, although it is statistically unlikely for the opponent to have Starlight Road, betting the game on them, not having it, was too risky for most players. Understanding your opponent and their play style was almost just as important as knowing how to play the game itself. And if you are getting callbacks to our GOAT format video, you should be, because there are a lot of things that are similar. By relating to someone's playstyle, thoughts, and management, players could gain advantages by bluffing cards and misrepresenting your position. An example could be bluffing Mirror Force to lead your opponent to not attacking. Although this is still relevant today, this technique is more prominent in slower formats where players fight for the slightest of advantages. Mastery of reading and playing around cards often leads to more consistent success in every format of the game. Also, I would like to talk about notable cards in Edison format. And there are many that we could talk about, but I want to get down to brass tacks of the few that are the most notable. Starting off with Raiko the Light Sworn Hunter. Raiko was a card that found itself in many decks during the format. Raiko's effect gave it versatility and contributed to the win conditions of many decks. And it had a simple effect. You would flip it, destroy one card on the field, and send the top three cards of your deck to the graveyard. Although at first glance, this effect doesn't seem splashable. Flexible destruction and mill were essential needs in this format. Raiko's ability to destroy not only monsters, but back row allowed it to clear away problematic and potential threats. The milling effect also contributed to the strategies of decks that played Debris Dragon, Dandelion, and Pot of Avarice. Raiko was also accessible by Super Nimble Mega Hamster and Sangin. Some decks took advantage of this interaction by setting Raiko off Hamster on the opponent's turn. When it came back around to your turn, you could flip Raiko to pop a card and then sacrifice it for a monarch. Raiko was an iconic card in this format and was one of the reasons so many decks side decked Nobleman of Cross. Out. Although in the modern 2022 format, a card like Raiko would seem underwhelming to say the least. It definitely had a well-deserved spot in Edison, however, and it's actually had a lot of different rulings in its history of being in the game. If you want to do your own little homework, I definitely suggest looking it up. It's, it's a bit of a ride, and that could be a video in of itself. Next up, we have Pot of Avarice. Pot of Avarice was a card that combined recycling resources while getting a plus one. With many decks in the format running Raiko, Avarice was an easy inclusion to pair alongside it. Avarice was a normal spell that allowed you to shuffle back five monsters from the grave into your deck and then draw two cards. The plus one on the card really made it great, as many cards in this format were meant to trade one for one. Avarice also allowed you to recycle powerful extra deck monsters such as Brionic, BRD, and Goyo, as well as main deck power cards such as Debris Dragon. This card would shine even greater in decks that had multiple mill cards such as Light Swarms with their milling engine and Quick Draw Dandy Warrior with Card Trooper. Avarice was just a great mid-late game card for the majority of the meta, while being able to give your engine a soft reset and netting you more cards. The card just did a lot in the simplest ways. Avarice would later on get limited and then banned, not seeing light again until 2020 when it finally came off the ban list. Next up, we have Cyber Dragon. Cyber Dragon's release back in Cybernetic Revolution made a meta-breaking impact. Although the card isn't as powerful as it was when it ended GOAT format, Cyber Dragon still does a lot in Edison. 
Cyber Dragon in Edison format serves two main purposes. The first purpose is that it acts as a simple beater. With Gladiator Beast and Blackwing still around, Cyber Dragon beat over common monsters. Cyber Dragon also conveniently beat over Debris Dragon's 2000 defense AS and Super Nimble Mega Hamster when the situation called for it. Cyber Dragon also acts as a pseudo board clear against machine type decks. With gadgets seeing a presence in the meta, Cyber Dragon can easily sweep up fields while netting you an often even more powerful monster to replace it. In some scenarios, Cyber Dragon can even turn to a 4000 attack plus Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon while removing scary cards such as Machina Fortress. Even before the days of Link Monsters, Cyber Dragon was still breaking boards. We also have Black Rose Dragon. Black Rose Dragon was a generic level 7 synchro from Crossroads of Chaos with a powerful effect. It quickly found itself as a staple in most extra decks. Black Rose Dragon's effect to nuke the field upon being synchro summoned is amazing. This effect was a great way to punish your opponents for overcommitting to the field without a reliable way of summon negation. An uncontested Black Rose would often immediately swing the advantage of duels in the user's favor. Black Rose Dragon's second effect allows you to banish one plant from your graveyard to change one of your opponent's monsters to attack mode and reduce its attack to zero. This effect saw some play in decks that chose to run a small plant engine. With Lone Fire Blossom and Dandelion being popular cards, this effect would see use in Quick Draw Dandy Warrior. This effect was also helpful in removing problematic monsters that had higher attack than Black Rose. Black Rose was just something that was very easy to go into. It was a level 7 generic synchro and was a great punisher of the format. Although Black Rose was limited to one, it could be recycled multiple times with Pot of Avarice. This made summoning Black Rose twice in a game very possible. With Black Rose being so impactful in games, it might might have been one of the big reasons why Starlight Road and My Body as a Shield was so common. And guess what was everywhere in Edison? Ha <laughs> ha! Even in GOAT format in Edison, some things don't change, even when they're five years apart. Book of Moon was everywhere in Edison. Although it was a minus one, it's often well worth it to stop an opponent's big power play. And to this day, people will still tell you that Book of Moon is the best minus one in the game. And guess what? Book of Moon was at three in Edison format. And as we all know, as a simple effect. Although already well known, Book could flip a monster to face down defense mode. This gave it tons of interactions both offensively and defensively. In terms of offense, Book was great for resetting flip effect monsters such as Raiko, Gravekeeper Spy, and Mega Hamster. This would often net you extra monsters which are very strong in a format where card advantage was so important. Defensively, Book was just a great answer to blocking attacks. Being able to halt strong attackers such as Shura, Fire Dog, and Glads, Book was a great temporary solution to a monster you can deal with next turn. Book could also help play around Dimensional Prison and Mirror Force, protecting monsters you want to keep and flipping them back if they haven't yet declared an attack. Book of Moon was all around just a great card. It had uses both offensively and defensively and could both save and win games. Although it just seems like a minus one on paper, there is a reason why almost every deck played two or three. So let's talk about some popular decks in this format. Starting off with the most notable, Quick Draw Dandy Warrior. Quick Draw Dandy Warrior is regarded by many as the strongest deck of the format. Although the deck looks like a weird selection of cards, its powerful combos made it a dangerous opponent. Quick Draw Dandy Warrior's main focus was to mill Dandelion to the graveyard with their selection of milling cards. Cards like Raikou and Card Trooper were strong standalones that also contributed to the milling strategy. Once the graveyard was stacked to your liking, Debris Dragon made it easy to summon threats from the extra deck while netting free tokens from Dandelion. Quick Draw Synchron was also strong because it could make Drill Warrior. With Drill Warrior being able to loop Dandelion, you could potentially spawn infinite tokens if uncontested. Outside of the extra deck, the deck also packed threats such as Titanial, Caius, and Light and Darkness Dragon. Grinding the deck down also proved to be a challenge with the three pot of Avarice that almost every list played. Because Quick Draw Dandy Warrior had such a plethora of small interactions between cards, delivering a wide overview of the deck in just a few short paragraphs is impossible. Quick Draw Dandy Warrior is considered one of the most difficult decks to play at the time and needed a strong player to pilot it to its maximum potential. Light Sworn is another deck that was also a top contender, and it was a deck that took four spots on the top 16 of Shonen Jump Edison and had three different variants among them. Although Light Sworns follow a similar game plan among the variants, small changes could change the build from Pure to Twilight to even Monarchs. As with Quick Draw Dandy Warrior, Light Sworn was a deck that even more prominently needed to send cards to the graveyard. Light Sworn had solid cards that removed threats from the board, such as Lila and Raiko, as well as big threats such as Judgment Dragon. The deck would also further capitalize on their milling style by incorporating cards like Plague Spreader Zombie and Necrogarda into many lists. Light Sworn was also one of the few decks able to fully utilize Cold Wave to create board states where they could safely slam down big monsters to overwhelm the opponent. Milling is one of the most fun mechanics in Yu-Gi-Oh! The biggest problem, however, with this is that it sometimes created problems in consistency. Without a wide variety of search cards, Light Sworns would often find clogged hands when they didn't include Charge of the Light Brigade and Solar Recharge. Despite that, Light Sworn still had a great showing and was a meta contender that could swing the game back with a single card. 
Can someone go and grab M. Cole 40 from making his market watches? Because gadget variants all centered around the same thing in Edison format. Their goal was to continuously summon gadgets in order to gain a card advantage over their opponents. Although gadgets are lower attack monsters, a bunch of removal spells and defensive traps help to clear problematic monsters. You know what, better yet, let me just play an old deck profile clip from M. Cole 40 back in the 2010s when I was like, what? 14 at this point. I was doing, I was born in 1996. So yeah, I think that math adds up right. And I think he can kind of show you what the format was like. T take it away, Robbie. Just just take it away. Uh, this is going to be a hot sideboard tech for this format, depending on how it goes. Um, its effect to negate anything during the main phase is just hella amazing. And I mean, you just discard it and you can do so much with it. It's multi-purpose stuff, Rikos, Hamsters, anything else that happens during your opponent's main phase, Monarchs, all that good fancy stuff. With the release of Machina Mayhem, Gadgets received an indirect buff in the form of Machina Fortress. Fortress gave Gadgets some much needed pushing power while not giving up much as the deck naturally gained advantage. Cards such as Ultimate Offering also helped Gadgets quickly swarm the board at the cost of some life points. Another card that helped Gadgets was Solidarity, which gave a much needed attack boost to all of your small Gadgets. Having Gadgets be relevant in the game is a statement to how important card advantage was in the meta. Since the whole archetype relied on consistently obtaining more monsters, removal was necessary in order to keep up the pressure. Although gadgets might just look like some low attack machines, there is a reason why System Down and Cyber Dragon and Robbie Cole were so popular in the side deck and also in the Yu-Gi-Oh community. Had to give a shout out to Robbie Cole there. Go look at some of his old deck prop files. They really are a trip. Although way past their prime, Gladiator Beasts were still a solid contender in the meta. While the deck hasn't exactly revolutionized since their initial debut, Glads were still strong at generating advantage through attacking with their power plays using Geyserus and Heraklinos. Even though there isn't much to mention, Glads were strong at creating advantages through using defensive back row with a variety of powerful effects. Ratari was particularly good for banishing the many resources in the graveyard. The deck was also able to quickly turbo out Geyserus using Prisma and Test Tiger, which can net huge advantages if not responded to, although not as strong as they were in their prime. Gladiators can be pretty scary after splashing down a cold wave at the start of main phase 1. And now we got to talk about everybody's favorite deck, the deck that never seems to die even in 2022, and that's Black Wings. Black Wings are one of the new mid-range archetypes of the 5Ds era. Although Black Wings were hit with Gale to 1 and Whirlwind to 2, the deck was still operational, playing off their swarming capabilities and strong trap cards. Black Wings were one of the first archetypes where it was easy to just splash your whole hand onto the field and proceed to play with yourself, as we also like to say on this channel. <laughs> With swarming effects built into Gale and Bora, accumulating damage was relatively easy, and going into Armor Master was often even easier. Although the deck is weaker than before, Black Wings play off the strengths of Icarus Attack, Delta Crow Anti-Reverse, and Royal Oppression to propel them into the front. Although a few decks could play Oppression in this meta, Black Wings could also play around it using Vayu and had solid main deck backers such as Kalut. Black Wings' biggest enemy in Edison was the existence of Consecrated Light. With Consecrated Light being able to neutralize almost all pressure Black Wings can generate, it found itself into many sides to counter Black Wings' Swarm strategy. However, Black Wings were still a solid contender in this meta and is still a fan favorite regardless. Rescue Cat was a terrifying card when it went uncontested, although there are many different types of cat variants. The main strategy consisted of running a small cat engine alongside another group of solid cards. Let's talk about Billy Break's Caliber Cat deck as an example. Billy's deck consisted of a small cat engine along with a chaos engine including Doom Caliber Knight, Raiko, and other chaos monsters. And as you can see here, Billy's card choices gave him advantages against many matchups, such as Cyber Dragon for gadgets. Although these cards shine when used for their specific matchups, they are also great standalones. Cat could summon two air bellums, which would immediately put your opponent at a disadvantage by removing two cards from their hand. By combining strong individual cards with the explosive power rescue cat, Billy was able to obtain a top four finish at Shonen Jump Edison. Now, Billy's deck on paper might just look like a standard beatdown deck, but it followed a principle of just countering the meta and playing powerful threat after powerful threat. By incorporating cards people would usually side in the main deck, such as Cyber Dragon, Billy was also able to craft a rather unique side deck. This cat deck was able to slow down the game by using Doom Caliber Knight and other solid cards until an explosive cat turn was played. However, this isn't the only cat deck in the meta. Secret Cat also found its way into the top 16 and had a very different but effective playstyle. Cat is perhaps one of the most flexible decks in the format and could definitely be a fun deck to play to surprise opponents. 
Ah, Flame Bell Synchro, the deck that made Jonathan Barber, local Jacksonville, Florida, Yu-Gi-Oh! player, which is here in my neck of the woods, famous for the nickname Fired Up Jonathan Barber that some Konami writer gave him. But Flame Bell Synchro was the deck that he piloted and is known for making the deck famous. And really, it was a good deck. Flame Bell Synchro was a deck that ran the Flame Bell Fire Dog package to make level 8 synchros with other engines alongside it. For this deck, the goal was very simple. Use Fire Dog to generate a level 8 synchro and pop Rekindling to turn the game around or go for the kill. The Flame Bell deck played a similar style to what Cat Variants would play and could grind you down slowly while attempting to control the pace of the game. This deck really shows its true strength with Rekindling, although the cost of playing the Flame Bell engine was to play Flame Bell Magician, a potential dead card. Yes, even back in 2010, people were playing Garnets. The rewards for playing such a card were well worth it, however, with some of the most powerful monsters in the game being level 8 synchros. Rekindling is really the star of the deck because it forces an immediate response or just ends the game. While Flame Bell may be one of the more inconsistent contenders in the meta, its explosive potential is also on the higher side of the decks. Playing against Flame Bell is very scary as you always need to be ready for a surprise rekindling. A format wouldn't be complete with some kind of degenerate burn deck, although of course we didn't have Mystic Mine in this format, and once again I say thank God, the Gravekeeper burn deck piloted by Rex Mendoza is one of the weird decks that acted as a stall burn deck with a semi-defensive beatdown engine. While there isn't much to explain here, this deck basically played a bunch of defensive and burn spell and traps alongside a Gravekeeper engine. The deck could also play aggressively if they were able to catch you with an early roll of tribute and then quickly beat you down with spies while sitting behind a wall of back row. This variant also sided into a cat engine that could catch opponents off guard and steal a games. Since I don't have any personal experience with this deck, I could only imagine how it operated. Because when my dad played Burn, he played straight Burn. He didn't use any Gravekeeper cards. And let's be honest here, this deck doesn't have as much of a quote, fun play style compared to the other decks in the meta. But I mean, at least this build I'm showing you is interesting, right? I mean, even if it looks boring on paper, results are results. And maybe some further testing could turn Gravekeepers into the dark horse of this meta. I don't know. I'm not going to be touching this deck with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> and I would also like to say that if you're a veteran of this channel, you may remember my self-destruct button troll deck that I didn't start playing until around 2012. But it was playable in this format. All the cards were here. Now, obviously, this deck has since been nuked out of orbit, but it's still fun to look back on regardless. If you think Mystic Mine is cancerous, nah, fam. Try playing against a deck that stalls out until game three just to go to time, then burn your life points or make themselves regain life points to get the W. Yeah, it, 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 it was a shit show. I would also like to talk about Diva Heroes. Uh, this was a deck that a lot of people played, and I'm having to go in here post-production as I'm putting the video together because I totally forgot to talk about it, but what you're looking at here is a Diva Hero build that topped at SJC Edison, and if you guys enjoy playing old school heroes, I highly recommend playing this because this is a really fun deck to play. It's similar to the Gemini Spark Elemental Hero, the Shining Hero decks that played like Skill Drain and really controlled the game. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, and I highly recommend you go play it. I would say it's the, along with gadgets, the control-based deck of this format. Finally, I'd like to end on this. Edison is a great format with a lot of variety in the meta. It was a format where you didn't need to play the best deck and win, and you wouldn't be an overwhelming underdog if you chose to. Although it lasted such a short time, it had a lot of the elements that players would come to enjoy. Interaction, outplays, management of resources were all very prominent in the top level of play during this time. What are some issues with this format? Well, similar to Go Control, not every player likes slow formats. If you like dropping your hand to proceed to play with yourself and make a board of Omni Negates and Interruptions, you may not like this format. However, if you give it a chance, I think you will come to like it. I'd recommend this format to anyone who wants to take a break from the modern Yu-Gi-Oh! or is just looking to play a past format. There are many resources online to help you learn more about the format, including lists of the top 16 on the official Konami page and numerous threads across the web. But if you guys did enjoy this video, a like and subscribe would be much appreciated. Be sure to tune in for the next episode, somewhere around next week or so, where we will be covering the format I hate the most, believe it or not, and that is Dragon Ruler format. 2013 to be exact. Yeah, that's going to be a fun one. Spoiler alert, I think the Dragon Ruler mirror match is not skillful at all. Don't at me. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for more. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.